Good morning, everyone. It's Lee Henson, president and founder of Agile Dad, and it's time for today's edition of The Daily Stand-Up. Without any further ado, let's get started. So we are on part three of our series about becoming a better Agile coach and some of the things that you can do to help resuscitate or to help invigorate or to help get your teams in line and help do things that are going to make you just that memorable coach that's going to help you in your journey uh, and it's going to help your organization as well. So if you haven't listened to part one and part two, I recommend that you listen to both of those parts first. They're on Tuesday, Wednesday, and now today, Thursday. So that way everything's there. It's all laid out for you. It's all planned out. So we're going to start with tip number 11 today. And it says, draw out the customer journey and value flow. I love this concept, right? I love the idea. I, I think that if you literally do empathy mapping, or if you do journey mapping or even story mapping, that's gonna help you better understand who your target user, who your persona is, uh, who, your, who your different uh, value users are, who are your key stakeholders. And it's gonna help you really identify how they're using your product or service. And once again, this one applies to things that are technical and non-technical. You should have a workshop or a session. And it doesn't have to be something completely formal. It could be something less formal, but it does need to be something where everyone can track and see that journey. One of the biggest complaints that I get from people who actually build products and services is that they lose the context when they get the backlog items. So a lot of times you'll see product ownership takes time to draw out a, a journey or a stream. But then what they'll do is peel off all the gaps, all the deltas, and make backlog items of, out of those and hand those to the team. And the team loses the context of the original flow. So it's just important for us to make sure we have a detailed understanding of the customer journey and the value flow. Uh, next, I want to discuss some IT practices if you were in the technical realm, talking about continuous integration, continuous deployment, and test automation. Anyone who's ever taken my class before will tell you if you've taken any of my Agile classes, one of the key takeaways is always focus on outcome over output. And the other key takeaway is Agile without test automation is dead. And I don't want to limit it to just automation. If you're building a product or service that doesn't have that type of testing, you can replace test automation with test optimization by breaking down tests and saying, is this a run once test or is this a run many times test? And that way you have it sorted and you know exactly what you need to do with those tests. Now, continuous in integration and continuous delivery, continuous deployment, these are not necessarily for everyone. So there are lots of companies out there that uh, potentially shippable certainly applies and then they're building towards a shippable product increment. I love that theory. That's kind of what Scrum was founded on from the very beginning. But there are times where you can deliver things more quickly. And I think the key here is to focus on less, limit your whip, get into a flow or a rhythm that matches your company's culture and what you're trying to do with your product or service and get something out there uh, that marries your IT practices to what you're trying to do. And what I can tell you is when you do this, you're gonna have great success. You're gonna see some really cool things happen. The next one might be one of my favorites to spend time on fun sessions, especially when working with distributed teams or working from home. I can't tell you how many times I try to play creative games or do fun things on Zoom. And it really does make a difference. When you're dealing with these teams who are used to working together, or they're used to being able to talk to their peers, or they're used to being able to have a water cooler conversation, when they're isolated and they're kind of at home, ooh, you know, it's just kind of crazy. Um, one of the recommendations that I think is really fun, uh, they have a two truths and a lie. And it could be work-related or non-work-related. You could do online Pictionary. Or, or, um, or, you know, there's also these things like online escape rooms, which are pretty darn cool, that you can go into and you really just teach the team that while our journey and our focus should be on work, that it's okay to have a little fun along the way. It's okay to interact with each other. It's okay to get to know each other personally and culturally. It's okay to do some fun things. And I think that when you get this uh, down, it's gonna help you better understand the needs of your distributed teams. It's gonna help you better understand the needs of the people who are out there. I worked for a company years ago and they would let their actual team members they would buy them copies of a game that they all liked, whether it was World of Warcraft or whatever the hit game was at the time, um, Command and Conquer, wh whatever it was. And they buy each person a copy and then they would um, allow them to play on server time you know, from wherever they were on work servers. And, you know, it sounds kind of silly and it sounds kind of hokey, but it was something that was a good memory for all those developers. And it really built camaraderie amongst the troops, no pun intended. And it allowed them to have better focus when they were actually working together. So it's just really interesting to see how I pulled the crew together. So that's an important one. 
Also, you should balance your distributed teams. I know a lot of times you have onshore and offshore. And a lot of times I hear we do all of our development here. And we send all of our testing to our offshore team in the Philippines or India, wherever they might be. And that's a problem. You want to make sure you have balanced teams that are cross-functional. You don't ever want to feel like if it feels like a volleyball match, it's probably not right. So if you feel like you're passing a buck one way or passing a buck the other way, not where you want to be. You want to make sure that your teams feel like they can comfortably deliver all the things that are being asked of them. And, you know, make sure testers are attending review sessions and that people are able to pair or do peer reviews and that you have mechanisms in place to work with and work for these distributed teams. Uh, this is, you know, I hate to use this term because it's not my favorite term, but I'm going to call it the new norm. You know, this is what we're going to be working through for at least the next year. Or so let's find a way to make it comfortable. Let's find a way to make people excited about the way that they work. So distributed teams need this balance. Address any problems you have directly to the leadership. I like this too. I think that even though what we do is always, you know, on the rewarding side when we deliver a high quality product or service, I think if we do have key issues or if we see things that are happening and we see that the team's getting broken down or we see that things are happening within the group, we want to make certain that we find a way to address problems directly with whoever it might be that needs to uh, take part in helping us remove that obstacle. Now, a lot of people lean heavily on a scrum master and say the scrum master is the impediment remover. Uh, if, if you ever really dig deep, what you'll discover is the scrum master is more like a doctor. They listen to all the symptoms of the things that are going on around them. They make a diagnosis. They'll write a prescription. And they'll give the team the prescription. And oftentimes it's up to the team to fill the prescription and take the prescription as recommended to solve the problem. Now, that's not to say that there aren't problems that a scrum master shouldn't solve. But I think that instead of enabling the team to continue to create and commit those problems again, it's important for the Scrum Master or Agile Coach to address major problems with leadership, but let the team resolve some of their own issues so that they can become empowered and feel good about what they're doing so that they can build that Agile culture. Now, I'm going to throw in a bonus instead of going 15 here. I'm going to throw in a bonus. Have an eye for the good things around you as well. And I talk about this one a lot. I talk about showing gratitude being grateful, looking at the good things that are happening around you and not just letting them slip by, but pointing out, hey, I saw this happen or I saw that happen. And even if it's just a small kudo or a little email or, hey, I saw you do this or thanks for that. You know, one of my larger clients, Delta Airlines, they have these little certificates that they give for frequent travelers. And uh, it says, I caught you doing this, you know, and it, it sounds so silly, but I know that each time I've ever given one of those out, I could see the gratitude on a flight attendant's face for saying, wow, you know, you, you recognize that I went out of my way to do something. And a lot of the times they say, well, it's just part of my job. But I would turn around and say, yeah, but it's part of your job that you do exceptionally well. And I think that it should be no different when we're dealing with people in a technical or non-technical setting, that we need to make sure we recognize good behavior, that we look for the good things around us, that we share the good around us and make sure everyone's aware that we're surrounded by good things because the world, it's real easy to recreate negative energy that's happening in the world today. So it's important for us to make sure that we can show the world, hey, that we can fill the world with good and flood it with positive thoughts because that's where we're going to have the most success. I hope you enjoyed this series. This three-part series was awesome for me. Lots of good information. I encourage you to visit agiledad.com where you can find more about this topic and many others. And if you have a topic that you want to hear in a daily stand-up, learn more at agiledad.com or kim at agiledad.com. She'd love to hear your topics and we'll make sure we do the best we can to get them covered. As always, we encourage you to stay healthy, stay well, and stay agile, my friends. Until next time, do take care.